We say what they can't radio. We got a lot in common. We laugh, we cry, we have lots of options. But there's healing when we just start talking. It's healing when we just start talking. Don't be afraid. Start off your day with the Leslie T. Marshall Experience. Welcome to our latest edition of the Leslie T. Marshall Experience. Today, I have some phenomenal guests here today, and we will be sharing with you our experience with grief. We know we're starting into the new year, and we just came out of the holidays, and many people did not celebrate the holidays as usual because they lost someone very important to them. And we want to remind you that you are not alone. We know with the Leslie T. Marshall experience, we always remember that there is healing and exposure. And so as we go through our story today, we hope that you will hear something that will bless you, that it will heal you and encourage you to know that you can keep going through your grief. So we're going to introduce our guests today. We're starting with Carlton. We have Dr. Boyd. We have Keely. We have Crystal. And we have Very Goods. And I want to thank you guys for joining us today. Welcome to the Leslie T. Marshall experience. So there's something out there. They say that Grief comes in stages, but it's not true for everyone because you might start off with denial. You might start off, you know, denying it happened. I think, Crystal, I was with you in the hospital when your dad died. And I remember your sister was just going through denial. Even though they came out, they said it was just you don't want to believe it. So um, I want to start there. I want to start with how did you handle and anybody's able to take the floor when you first heard, Dr. Boyd, you lost your mom on 9-11. So I'll start with you. And please tell the people about yourself and your age when this happened. Yeah, so um, I was 12, uh, September 11, 2001. And um, I was at my aunt's house. Um, and it wasn't the typical, the doctors come out and tell me my mother passed away or uh, they found her body. And, you know, here's the evidence. Um, mine was just out of the ordinary. Um my story just blends to the idea I was sleeping on my aunt's couch. My uncle told me to turn the TV on and to call my mother. My mother worked in the second tower. And um, as soon as I called her, all the lines were busy. Then the plane went into the second tower. Um, young, confused, didn't know, you know what was going on. I knew she had been in the first terrorist attack in 93 or 94. Um, she came home, well, she came home, took a shower, picked me up from school. You know, we moved like it was a normal day. Um, However, this time it was a little different because mom never came home. Um, And it took me all of maybe about six to eight years to really accept the fact that my mother was gone. Mm. Um, And I think the reason being that for that is because uh, there was no no body. Uh, We didn't we didn't have a a burial. We didn't have a funeral. There was no closure to anything. Um, and so it took me a very long time to accept, and then it took me even longer time to grieve that process after. Wow. And Carlton, I want to come to you because I know you recently lost your dad. I'm not exactly sure the amount of time, but I know it was a recent loss, and I had the pleasure of knowing your dad, a fine man. Um, and I know today we're talking on parents and losing a parent, but I know you also lost your brother Correct. in your home where you lived. Yes. So um, you could tell the people a little bit about that, please. Um, well, first, my father was diagnosed with cancer. Um, it, it really was a, within the time he was diagnosed to the time he passed away. It was really just a few months. We didn't know how uh, progressive the cancer was. Um, he was he actually ended up going to hospice and passed away in hospice. So the family was around him. We did get to spend his last few days with him. Um, but it was just a quick process. So I, I guess for me, I guess I was in disbelief a little bit, not knowing what was going on because it happened so quick. The transition was so quick from right. him being looking healthy to him actually looking like a, basically like a skeleton laying in the bed. Wow. Um, my brother actually passed away a few days before Christmas, mm-hmm. a few years back. Um, he actually had an asthma attack that he actually tried to crawl on the floor out to my mother, who had just had surgery. She was actually in the living room because she couldn't stay in her bed. Uh, he was trying to crawl to her to get to her. And by the time he got to her, when she found him, he was already collapsed in, in the hallway of our home. Um, by the time the ambulance got there, he... She said she thinks he was still there, but from my, what I felt is he already passed away from that from asthma attack. He just couldn't breathe. Um, so that's how I've lost kind of both two parents close to the holidays, to tell you the truth. My father was in October, my brother was in December around that time. So holidays are really a tough time for our family. So. Wow. And I, and I, listening to your story, it's also a reminder that 
We see people every day and we have no clue the struggles that they go through. And that's including grief because grief, there's no time limit on grief. Grief will come up and hit you. You hear a song, you smell something, you're just in a familiar place. And all of a sudden it, it'll hit you. I remember when I lost my grandmother and um, I was like, okay, I'm good. I had like 10 cries this week. I'm good. It's over. And then I'm going into a restaurant and I see something that she would like to order and I'm tearing and I'm embarrassed. I'm sitting at my desk and I'm like, okay, are they seeing these tears falling down my eyes? I'm like, oh, it's my allergies, you know? And we have the right to cry. We have the right to mourn. We have the right to have these feelings. And so I'm hoping that someone hearing this will know that grief does not have a time span. Keely, we'd love to hear about your parents. Um, um, okay. I lost my mother in, I want to say it was 2001, uh, February 2001, February 5th, I believe, somewhere around there. And then I uh, lost my dad in 2003, um, and then I lost my brother in 2009, January 5th, 2009. Yeah, if I could look. Back to back right. hits. Yeah, it was back to back. It was back to back. And each experience was different. Um, my mother was hard. That was a really, really tough one because it was unexpected, even though she told me it was going to happen. Um, but she wasn't sick where it could happen. So then when she took sick, it just was like <coughs> conversation. And then the way that I was told was harsh. Yes. It was disbelieved. Yes. It was, um, it was... Yeah, it was interesting. Um, it was a hard blow. But my dad, I don't know. I'm going to be honest. It's all like sometimes it feels real. Sometimes it's like, it's whatever, you know. Keely, your dad died from multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And what was the process of going through the stages? Because there's a different way that people leave us. Some people leave us, boom, instant. They're going. Yeah, my mom it. was instant, gone. Some people, it they was don't leave a shock. Dead. My father, my father got diagnosed in the late, <clears throat> in the mid 90s. Right. Early, excuse me, early 90s, late 80s, around that time. I want to say I was like 11 when my dad got diagnosed. Wow. But MS, um, I didn't quite understand what it was, but my uncle already had it. Right. And then my uncle passed in 95, and then my dad passed after him. So I kind of was expecting it, but not right. really, because I knew people who are still living with it. I'm living with it. Um, but it was, I think I was a little more prepared. Right. You could never be too prepared for losing right. your parent, but right. my dad became a vegetable. You know, he couldn't walk. It was stages to it right. that led to it, but... Yeah, it's yeah. It was a different type of grieving process with that, and then also when you lose a parent and you have children, I think it makes it. I don't want to say easier, but you got to keep going. Right. Yeah. Like you don't got a choice, but the mm -hmm. I don't got time to really think about this. I got to right be back for this animal. right exactly. Mm -hmm. I understand. I yeah. Understand for that, and I I never wanted to sensitize death because death <clears throat> is hard. Grief is hard, and sometimes as we're speaking about death. Um, there's other ways people mourn. People mourn relationships with people that are still living. People mourn jobs. Mm -hmm. People mourn people. So there's other things that you can mourn, but grief is still serious nonetheless, whatever it is, because if you're stuck and you can't move on, then th you have to get some help. And we'll talk about some of those ways later. Um, and I was not minimizing um, the stages that your dad, you know, or anybody when you see the stages, but I realized that if I had a choice and I could say, God, if you're going to tell me somebody's leaving me, I'm not good on the instant calls. I'm not good on the instant accidents. Mm -hmm. You get a call and you just saw them. I would prefer going through stages. Because <laughs> okay. Wouldn't we all? <laughs> no, you leaving. Yes, I would. Because I wouldn't we shared an uncle who died of multiple sclerosis. And now That's that I'm uncle, older, though. yeah, I appreciated being able to go to hospice, see him give a hug, tell him I love him one more time. That's just my experience. I appreciate yeah. being able to say goodbye, saying goodbye 25 times, because sometimes I notice in hospice, hospice when someone's dying, they will call you and say, today's the day. You're not going to see them. They're gone in a week. And, you know, working at hospice, it can become insensitive because they do this day in and day out. So they do know what death looks like. They do know they haven't eaten in three or four days. They're, they're out of here. But that's our loved one, and we don't want to let them go. And yeah. so... 
My uncle was different, like you said, you're right about that. But when my grandmother was dying in hospice and the lady told me, oh, she's probably got like three days. I'm not a fighter, but I was ready to punch in her face. Like, no, you're not God. And sometimes that's another part of one of the stages of grief is acceptance and accepting it for what's coming. And I just, I just prefer the warnings. Crystal, your dad passed, and I know that was very heavy for your family in every, you know, like everyone has experienced. Could you share some of that with us, please? Yes, my dad uh, was in the hospital from COVID and uh, he was in there about a month. He was talking, laughing with us. We couldn't go and touch him, obviously, but we were there um, every day. Uh, my sister went every single day uh, to make sure, you know, everything was going right. And then just one day they was like, his heart is failing. And I'm like, what? We were just there. Um, and... Then they asked us to put him on a ventilator. And that was hard because we were like, Dad, this is happening. So we had to make a decision fast. So once we did that, um, his health just started to decrease. Um, but we were, it was so, we were looking at the breathing machine. And once it's at a certain thing, we're like, okay, he's good. He's doing well. And I just got a call from my sister and I was like, they say he's not going to make it. You got to come now. Um at that time, my little sister was in college and she just came up and we didn't really want to tell her how bad or how, you know, we just yes. wanted to kind of wait it out. Um, but I don't know, the spirit just called when she got here and we all just went to the hospital and it was like an out of body experience, me seeing them pump him. And it's like, wow, um, they was like they couldn't do anything else. And I was just stuck. It, it just I don't know. It feels like yesterday. Um, he died in 2021 of May, May 15, 2021. Um, but I could see it. It replays in my head all the time. Mm -hmm. And watching them do whatever they had to do to him and just him passing. Um, again, I I still haven't really got to go through my grief, if that makes sense, because yes. I had to be in charge of everything. Yes. Putting together mm -hmm. his funeral. Um, my sisters, my siblings, mind you, I have four others. Um, they were out of it. They couldn't take it. It was um, very hard for them. My sister, we had to do, we had to, we almost took her to the hospital, how bad she was. So somebody had to step up and, if, and yeah, fortunately it was me. And um, yeah, so I never really got, this is the first time I'm even talking about it. Never, never really got to say what my experience was with that. Um, so, Crystal, I thank you so much for that. Um, as everyone speaks, I'm only smiling because as you, when your dad died, I, we're, our friendship allowed me to be there. So I was able to be there, hold your hand. I mean, you had a thousand people around you, but it's to me, that's another blessing of having a good circle. Because when my grandmother died, I had just, I had a really mean boss. <laughs> I'll take that. And I was in Florida and we, you know, we were taking turns going to Florida. And I said to her, I had just started working for the city, so I wasn't aware that they couldn't fire me. But I knew I had only asked for a week to go see about her. And I said, well, hospice is saying my grandmother's gonna die in two, three days, can I stay? She said, did you do the paperwork? And I was like, uh, no, and I didn't wanna lose my job. So I'm like, well, if my grandmother she was to herself, she was already out of it on her way out. She would want me to work, West Indian old lady. She'd be like, girl, you gotta lose your job. I'm going to heaven, don't worry about me. And so I left and she died two days later. It's not a regret, but it's a small guilt I live with because I, I, I in the past, I used to say F these jobs. So I should have just said to help with this job. Let me stay with my grandmother. But I said, I go work, fill out the paperwork and come back. But I never got that time. And so being at the hospital with you guys and watching, because one thing I think, if you have a family member, in the hospital, somebody needs to be there because they're going to do what they want to do. They're going to treat them. And right before I go to um, Mr. Berry, I just think that it's so important. People think you pay these hospitals to do a certain job. And I admired your family being there. And I, I just have to smile because when I saw your sister, who to me, she needed a video camera because she was going in. This is her father. She was like, I was like, I don't even know what to say. And I'm never lost for words, but she tore that hospital up. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's how I would be, you know, when my grandmother died. And it was like watching her. And I was like, I don't know what held me, but you just said something. You said, this is your first time talking about it. My pastor, who you know, in Florida, he said to me three weeks later, you haven't even breathed yet. 
you haven't breathed. And I realized I didn't breathe for like four weeks mm -hmm. when my grandmother was dying. I never went, because I couldn't believe this was happening. Like I had been with this lady for what, 46, 44 years. And so now we all have to learn to get to this new normal. This person you call every day, this person you go to for everything you could talk about. So, uh, Mr. Goods, you want to share with us when you lost your loved one, please? Um, I lost I lost my mother in uh, the early '80s. I, my mother passed away, or I want to say passed. My mother was killed, to put it bluntly, and uh, this was '86, '87. I can't even remember the year. It was so at that time, you know? And uh, to this day, I think I still grieve to this day. The reason why I grieve to this day, I was I was a young kid, but I made a conscious decision as a young kid to run away from home on the day of the funeral. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I missed the funeral. I didn't know how to accept that reality at that young age. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to accept being around family members that was going to be there and give you the hugs and, you know, all this sympathy stuff. I didn't know how to accept that and didn't and didn't want to be. As, as I'm remembering it now, you know, some these conversations make you remember things of that nature. And I would just remember not wanting to be around people with the sympathetic hugs, the sympathetic talks. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't ready for all that. So on the day of the funeral, I disappeared, went missing for two days. You know, everybody's looking for me, you know. But at the same time they're looking for me, they also knew that I was okay. How old were you? Um, at that time, I think I, I would say about 11 or 12. Wow. Mm. Maybe 11 or 12. I, I, it was about 11 or 12. Matter of fact, I want to, yeah, I want to say 11, 10, 11. I can't, like this, you know, <laughs> I can't even put a year on it, but I know it was in within that year of 86 to 80. Mm -hmm. It was within that window span because right after that, you know, um, I was for the streets. Mm -hmm. Right after that, I was literally for the streets. Mm -hmm. Did you have siblings? Yeah, I had siblings, mm -hmm. but I was the oldest of the siblings at that oh. time. I was the oldest. When I mean oldest of the siblings at that time, it wasn't until I got in my 30s to realize that or to be introduced that I had older yes. siblings, twin siblings that I still haven't met yet, but I know the stories out now mm -hmm. that, you know, That's you do have now. older siblings that was before you. So that was, your, that was your COVID mechanism, going to the streets? No. Um, the, I guess you can't say that. Maybe, maybe you can't say that. But it's also the reason why I don't go to nobody's funeral today. Mm. I don't go to, I'll, I'll come to the funeral dressed up like I show up to the building, but I won't go in to interview anybody's body mm. because I felt I still hold that, that grief that I didn't do that for, for my own mom. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I hear about, you know, what y'all having. That's like even just now as we walked in this building, I, I, would, I would just get sent a text saying that, you know, they was going to let loose balloons for um, somebody who recently passed away, mm -hmm. you know? And I said, wow, I can't even make it to come here. But on the day of their funeral, I wouldn't even show up. When, I, wouldn't, I would still when I went to view nobody else's body because mm -hmm. I'm still grieving from what happened on the day of, your mom. of my mom's, you mm -hmm. know? And mind you, that I was a young, I was a young kid that made a conscious decision like that mm -hmm. and went missing for two days behind it. And it wasn't until in my 30s that I had to find out the real story of what actually happened with her being killed, mm -hmm. you know? So so it's 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 a big tragedy that I didn't even had the full grasp of that day. Right. That I just really get the real story, you know, being a grown yes, man. Funny, yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. So... Crystal and both you and Barry both said something that um, reminded me. Um, I'll always resort back to my grandmother because I, I did lose a sister when I was nine. She got hit by a car. So that's probably my first 
um, grief that I had to deal with as a little girl. But when you're little, I think you deal with it differently. You know, sibling, me and her only had seven years together. She was seven and I, whatever. But it's still a hurt. It's a trauma. And I didn't even realize that, you'll hear me say a lot, that I was dealing with trauma. I didn't know it was trauma. I just thought somebody dies, we go to the funeral, we keep moving, life goes on because that's what we were taught. Not that it's right, but that's what we were taught. When I was 15, my first boyfriend, this is, um, I guess, I don't, I don't know if the crack era was beginning, but this is when everybody in East New York was just picking up guns and killing people. Nice, innocent kid gets shot on the street and my mother shipped me off to Florida. But it was a very hurtful thing because I, I didn't, we didn't know people getting killed, you know, like that. So it was just so hurtful. But all of these, my therapists have told me it was trauma, but I didn't realize it was trauma. You just cry, you get over it, you think about it sometimes. But becoming an adult and having to deal with losing someone. Now, as Keely said, you're responsible for other young people who love these people who have now left us. And Crystal, as you said, this is another little plug in for people listening Get your paperwork in order That's because That's it's correct. a lot of things. You think that people love you is going to follow your directions. It does not always work that way. And I don't care if you don't have their name on that paper and they don't know about it. It doesn't matter. You could be with somebody 30 or 40 years. You drop dead. They know you're not coming back. They're going to do what they want to do with your stuff. Put your paperwork in order. That's the, that's what I'm tell you. But when my grandmother left us, um, you know, it's no military secret. I was one of my grandmother's favorite. Mm. And we were close. It's like a cheap shop. Everybody knows it. But um, I did feel. and I could She been, had to raise you. I could have been. She and you were her been, first yeah, grandchild. First and she did, did have to raise And I spent a lot of time with her and my children many times. You know, with, for whatever reason, that's another podcast. I was her favorite. And we... She had no choice. We, I was there. <laughs> Other people would call me and say, how's granny? I would go and sit on her couch and be bored to death, but I wanted to be up under my grandmother. <laughs> and it's a choice I made. But um, it does me good now because now that she's not here, I have different kind of grief. I don't have grief that I didn't call her enough. I don't have grief that I didn't go and see her enough. That's not my grief. My grief is different, but... What I wanted to say was, whether it was intended or not, when my grandmother left, I felt like certain people had things that they always wanted to say, like very talked about the hugs and the people coming to you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, sometimes you get other kind of responses from people, like people that knew I was close to my grandmother called me right away. I think Keely called me, my cousin Calvin, he called me, he said, I didn't call nobody, I called you first because... The first thing they say, Leslie's always up on the anti joint. So they call me and I appreciate it, but I felt I was fine. But my point is, there's also people that use death to be a little even more negative. And they start fighting over things and saying comments that hurt. And they don't realize somebody's in the midst of grieving. Like, I don't want to discuss this right now. This is not the time. This is the time for us to get together as a family, love on one another, be there for one another. This is not the time to say hurting things to people. And I know that when you have a death, things come up, you know, and people have opinions, but people have to be very careful because I'm still dealing with forgiving people who said things and they knew they were wrong and they've apologized. But sometimes my daughter brings it up, my son brings it up and I remember hearing it too. So it means it didn't just sting me, it stung them. You understand? Can I, can I say course. this? Um, I think, uh, to your point, but also to your point, at 12 years old, 12, 11 years old, you don't know how to handle um, uh, the passing of a parent. Yes. Um, and I think it was God that did not allow me to speak to my mother that morning. Because mm. my aunts had spoken to her. My mother's best friend spoke to her when she saw the first tower going to the first building, uh, the plank on the first um, tower. Um, and they told her to get out. I think to that point <clears throat> that um, not knowing what to say Yes. Um, because I think I had been so desensitized to death yes. because from my family, mm -hmm. starting in 94, I had a cousin pass, 95, my grandma, my great grandmother passed away, 96, another cousin passed from AIDS, my grandfather passed in 97, I had an uncle pass in 98, wow. then we waited about two years, in 2000 I had an aunt pass away, in 2001 I had an uncle pass away and then my mother passed away. Mm -hmm. So all of my, <clears throat> just all of my adolescence, I was done. at funerals down south. That was like our family reunion in a sense, you know? Um, and so I dealt with death, but my aunts didn't deal with it too well. And I don't know if I was the nicest person to them. And so sometimes I may say things like, oh, you know, and in my head, I'd be like, why are they crying so much? Like mm -hmm. we, we go through this, right? Um, but it was their sister, you know? It was my mom 
Um, and we were very close, but I kind of treated it in a sense where it, I treated it like any other death that I had dealt with. That's how you coped. Mm. That's how I coped with it yeah. for years. That's how you coped. Um, and my thing was just like, well, y'all sitting over here crying. She's coming back. Like, you know, she's probably someone who lost her mind or, you know, yeah. out here in a hospital, hurt or something like that. Um, but I, I, I agree with you. I don't think people know what to say and how to say. Sometimes I don't want you to quote, quote scriptures to me. That no, part. That part. You know, I, I don't want you to tell me it's going to be all right because it's, it's not, not going to be okay. Right um, and, and, they, and these are just insensitive things that people, they mean well, mm -hmm. but they just don't say the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think people have to learn how to be um, sensitive to the spirit, but also sensitive to the atmosphere in which you're in. And so sometimes just saying, I'm just sitting, I'm just going to sit here with you and I'm going to just, mm. just listen. Mm -hmm. And even if nothing comes out of the conversation, as long as I know you're there with me, mm -hmm. you know, your presence makes more than what you have to say. Yeah. I believe when, that on, um, on his point, I believe that you don't really know how to unless you've been through it. That's correct. Yeah. So I had a, I had recently, my friend, my friend's father died on Thursday. Um, so when I called and I'm like, I'm not going to tell you anything because when it was my turn it sounded like ling, 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 to me right yes, um, that's up. <laughs> that part. Right. so it's like i said i don't even know i i don't have anything to say but if you need something i'm here right mm -hmm. um but i didn't i used to say deep con my condolences you know god wants you in a better place yeah. ba, 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 ba. i used to do it all the time until i lost my until i lost mm -hmm. my dad yes. right um yes. so now it doesn't even make sense for me to like i'm very sensitive to it sensitive to it now mm -hmm. right I so i um i with losing everybody it was different um different experience as i said before but with my mom I didn't want anyone to touch me. Mm. I was just like, stop touching me. Like, stop hugging me. Mm. Stop telling me it's going to be okay. Don't talk to me. Like, I just, I didn't even tell my best friends my mother passed. They found out after um, the funeral and everything. It was like, why didn't you tell us? Like, you know, and I'm like, because honestly, for my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, everybody that was there was just like, you didn't lose your mother. You, didn't, you don't know what I'm feeling. But they also were grieving heavily. But it was just like, you have no idea, like, what I'm actually feeling in real time. With my father, it was chaotic because it was a money thing. Each experience was different. Mm -hmm. So my father, the family got real greedy, and they're probably going to see this and have something to say, but I do not care. <laughs> um, it's, it's the I don't your, care. Your feelings are bad. Your feelings are bad. I found out after the New York Stock Exchange found out, and my aunt called, God bless the dead, and said, get the papers rolling. I found out from my direct family after the New York Stock Exchange called me and offered their condolences. And I was like, who died? I'm, I'm confused. Who, who passed? And they were like, your dad. And I was like, oh, he did? Okay. And I'm sitting here nursing my baby and I'm like, mm, okay, let me, okay. Uh, like I couldn't. And then my wow. cousin that worked at the exchange called and said, the exchange called and offered their condolences. Oh, they called you too. Okay. And then finally I got the call from my aunt saying um, he passed. And I was just like, all right. Okay. And I had to, I think I called my sister, whatever. We figured it out from there, but it was, it was a different experience. My brother was a totally different experience. Like God told me he was going to die before he died. So that was a whole nother experience. But I think grieving him was easier, but not really. It, it was honestly... We went back to the same funeral home for each and every one of them, except for my mom. And they was like, oh, who now? Like Shout each time it was like, "Wow, wait, who, who passed now? Wow. Oh no, such and such passed. Like they knew us. They were too familiar. That's, and it was and just that's, like- That's very that's, interesting when the funeral yeah. home knows you on they first name basis. They knew us from my grandmother to my great grandmother yes. to my uncle, then my father, then my brother. It was just like back to back like- Okay. Oh, wait, who now? But each time they did a great job, but it was business for my sister and I. From my mother to my father to my brother, it was just like, you got to handle business. So each, each experience is a different experience. And know? I think that those experiences what allows us to be a blessing to other people. But I have to touch on this, Dr. Boyd. Then I'm coming to you, Carlton, back to Barry. Um, I wanted to touch on what you said, Dr. Boyd, because when my grandmother passed, 
outside. And the reason you'll hear me talk about my grandmother outside of the other death is once my grandmother died, I said anybody could die and I'm fine. I've mm-hmm. experienced the worst of the worst. For me, I don't know mm-hmm. yet unless because nobody loved me like my grandmother. Nobody listened to me. Like it was just a genuine relationship. So when I say she was, I was her favorite, she was my favorite person. Like right now, I feel homeless because you know you have that place you go back that's home. I don't have that anymore. So it's deeper than me just saying she, she, I was her favorite. She was my favorite. We just spent special times that I've never had with anybody else. It doesn't mean I don't love my mother or my father, but those, her death was my state. You get what I'm saying? I pray nothing happens to my children, blah, blah, blah. But my point is when my grandmother died, we had tent meeting that day and we were at the church and we were outside and Music was about to come on, but I didn't have to say, I couldn't stop crying. And one of my friends, her name is Shamika, shout out. She's young, younger than me. You know, she she just rubbed my back. She just would not stop rubbing my back. She didn't talk. She didn't say anything. And that's all I needed. Because um, one of my best friends, another one, Tanya, she was just saying the other day, people going by these my sincere condolences card. I don't want a condolence. I don't want to say on the loss of your mother, on the loss of your father. You're now repeating to me what I already know. How about a card that says, I'm thinking of you today. Just send me some sunshine. And and those quotes, those cliches that people say, they're in a better place. I don't want to hear a scripture like Dr. Boyd said. I don't need, even if I'm not biblical, spiritual, I don't want to hear scripture. Because if I know it, I already know it. Right now, my heart is in pain. And I don't know what to say. I don't want to eat. I don't want to drink. I just need you, like you said, Dr. Boy. That's so important that people know. Just be in there. Can I take your children to school? Can I, can I bring a meal over? You know, think outside the box. And I know it's just a straight line. Everybody does the same thing because we all put it on Facebook every day. My condolences. I'm sorry for your loss, but do not post there in a better place. Because if you just lost somebody, a better place would be right here that next part. to me. That's why I want you. Mm-hmm. So, Carlton, I'm coming to you because you lost your dad. So now you have to deal with your mother's grief. And that had to be something. Can you tell us something about dealing with now? I know you and your mom are very close yes. as you are her only son left. So how would you talk about that we would like to hear please i would say it was very hard because with my brother passing my mother still has not even finished dealing with that um so she's still in grief and now her husband had passed away so even to this day you know you catch my mother sometimes crying or just talking about my brother especially with the holidays passing now right. she wrote up to me remind me say hey you know your brother just passed this is the, the anniversary of your brother just passing and it kind of hits me back again mm-hmm. and she'll tell you all the time she feels like she's not really living Mm. And how do you how do you take that from somebody who's supposed to be your mother? Mm. Feeling that they're telling you that they don't feel like they're living, they're just walking around on earth right now. Yes. You know, mm. because they lost their loved ones. And especially with me having a, a small child myself, like Keely said before, you kind of just have to pick yourself up and have, especially when you have a child. But now yes. this is my my child's only grandparent left. Mm. Yeah. So she feels like she's kind of dead inside. How do you deal with that as, as a son myself? Yes. So it's it's very hard. Um Especially when you're dealing with your own grief too, as well, you have to deal with somebody else too, as well. Mm-hmm. How do you kind of check on that? That's something you just kind of go, gotta go through day by day. There's mm-hmm. no set answer for that. There's no set way to do it. Mm-hmm. You just gotta kind of deal with it and kind of support that person while you're trying to support yourself. Wow. Um, thank you so much for that, Carlton. Um, um, Mr. Berry, I wanted to ask you when your mom passed and you being so young. Um, who stepped in the gap and took over and was the leadership or was able to guide you as far as a parent? Um, um, cousins and family. I believe, I believe everybody stepped up in some in some fashion. Even if it all, even if I don't remember it in its entirety, mm-hmm. you know, um, I know some of everybody stepped up. Even not not even just family, the block. Mm-hmm. You know, the block stepped up on it. You know, you the block you grew up on, you know, you walk mm-hmm. up, they all said something or did or meant some gesture of 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 knowing that you just lost something and and, and they, they felt for you. Mm-hmm. So in 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 my adult in my adult age now, I look back like nobody knows what to say, nobody knows what to do. Right. But we all come to a point that we know they meant well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know we we because um, I I I ran across some people like I'm one of them people that goes constantly into a thing who who have their parents around right and I see them not acting right. appreciative mm-hmm. towards them. so I'm one of them, like what are you you know I 
I go through that. Mm -hmm. That's a constant battle I go through. Yeah. To this day, I, I cannot day. help going through that battle <laughs> with somebody that has a parent and acting f cursing in front of them, cursing them. Yeah, as if they them. don't appreciate them. Yeah. As 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 if as, and in my mind, it's like they do not understand what it's going to be like the day after. Now you're like, oh, I miss my such and such, you know. She Listen. Was, no, you was just yesterday, you didn't curse them out. Yeah. Appreciation. Or respect. You know, so, mm -hmm. I, on the I, I don't, I don't brush off anybody's way of showing their condolences to me because mm -hmm. I know, I just always go with this fact that they meant well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if they was overburdened, was doing all the extra, you know, I really don't want you here, but I know you mean well. Yeah. You constantly talk, she in a better place. To, ah, I don't want you here, but I know you mean well. Mm -hmm. So that's I'm good in that, that you thought about that because yeah, you come, you got in that moment, I'm like, they, go they mean, that way. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to, you don't, I didn't want to be the extra meaning on top of something drastic that happened. Mm -hmm. When, Especially when you already know in your mind. They meant well. Probably didn't come across right. Probably wasn't at the right time. Probably mm -hmm. was a little overburdened. Probably was all of that. But we yeah. still got to go back into a being a adult, especially when you're an adult in the picture. You could say, yes. like, I know they meant well. You know, right. and applaud if, them for what If they I can, um, you, had, you had cousins, right? I had aunts. Yeah. My mother's two sisters um, that lived here in New York. Uh, they stepped in and tried to make everything as normal as possible for me. Mm. Um, and so while you all have lost uh, relatives older and I lost mine younger, I would not know what I would do if I lost my aunt at this age now, mm. 22 years after my mother passed, yeah. because they stepped in as mom. They mm. still step in as mom. Um, when, like... Even like for every single thing, when it came to my college process, when it came to me figuring out how to handle my money, you know, from from this incident, um, they set me up really well. Yeah. Um, and That's beautiful. it's it's amazing because some people don't have that village Absolutely. when they're that young. But I just want to know what was you all's village like when when you lost your parents? I at was an nineteen older age? in college when I lost my mom. Um, I had my cousin Garland who was in college also at the time. And she was like a mom figure, like, you know, that big cousin mm -hmm. that's like, and then she had children. But my sister and I were on our own from a very young age. We were forced to kids without being in the mm -hmm. system. So my mom was sick, um, took sick again. She, my mother was schizophrenic and she left our lives when I was 11 years old. She put me out um, because of her mental illness. So I was like a ship without a sail for a long time. Wow. So we went from house to house. Like my I went my mother dropped me off um um in these projects my aunt and family was living at. And then from there my grandmother sent my dad or my grandmother sent for me. My grandmother passed away right after that. And then my father, you know, was still young and in these streets <laughs> with the women. He was gorgeous. But he also had a lot of women, you know, mm -hmm. so it was him fighting his illness, fighting with the different women, mm -hmm. finding out there was different women. We raised ourselves for a long time. And then we had like the aunts and the uncles who were there, but nobody loves you like your parents Absolutely. love you. And I don't care what aunt, what uncle. So when my mom finally passed, I thought my aunt and uncle mm -hmm. was stepping but everybody had their own lives, mm -hmm. you know? And no, nobody really stepped in. We were on our own for a long time and we just continued to be to on do. our own. Yeah. My, it was my sister and I were opposites. <laughs> but we, you know, in certain moments, it was like, all right, we got to do this. Right. We got to figure it out for each other. Um, and we figured it out and we're still trying to figure it out. Like, we right. really didn't have... We had a big family, but I could say we had nobody. Like, yeah. really, because everybody had their own lives that they were living. And the mm -hmm. people you thought would be there the most that was closest to her wasn't. The people you thought that would be there the most that was closest to him weren't. Like, no, nobody was there. You know? Yeah. So they were there, but they weren't there. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. You could call them, 
But after, you know how it is. After the funeral's over. You hear from no one. Everybody's there like, oh, I got you. I'm going to do this. Yeah. And my mother has siblings. And my father has siblings. And I, I probably wasn't the family favorite. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm the black sheep. I'm black sheep, but I'm all right. I like me. You look nice and um, black, by the way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you see it? But, um, but I, I, I can't say. I have friends mm -hmm. now. Like, I prayed for friends, and the friends that I have now, I'm like, that's my family. Like, But I thank God for my cousin Garland in the real hour that it happened. Her hugs felt real. Her love felt real. So, but, you know, she had to go on and take care of her husband and her kids. And, you know, yeah. everybody go away and that's things get back to, to normal yeah. for them. But you don't realize in real time, wait, this person is still trying to survive. Yeah. You know, but we were, I hate to use the word abandoned. We were abandoned. And dealing with an orphan spirit before my parents passed. Right. So your feelings are always valid. Yeah. Absolutely. What about you, I actually want to jump on your point where you were just saying about if mm -hmm. you lost your aunts to this day, I feel mm -hmm. the same way. I think about it every day. Yeah. If I lose my mother today, I don't know what I would do. I'm a yeah. grown man with a child, a wife, home. And yeah. if I lose my mother today, I don't know what I'd be. Yeah. I know if I could be the person I need to be for my child, for my wife at home right now. Yeah. And I think about I that's know. something I think about every single day. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I go on. So I just want to jump on that point you were saying before. Well, life has changed drastically for me because right after my dad died a couple of months, mm -hmm. my mom had a, a massive stroke. Where, uh, where did she have that She stroke? had it in Georgia. Where, where uh, was she standing when she had the stroke? In the airport. Wow. So she was in the airport and had a stroke. Um, she went straight into... Uh, surgery <clears throat> and um life has not been the same so i i, I feel like i don't want to get emotional i feel like i lost both my parents because she's not the same my mom right so <clears throat> yeah move on <laughs> but i don't i don't we just trying to make it yeah as life has changed we made so many plans and it's so crazy with my dad and be like, oh, he gonna do that. Oh, he's he'll because he was the one that took care of everything. And even with my mom getting sick, I know if he was alive, like I wouldn't have to do as much as I have to do now, because he's always the one to step in. So that loss really took like a hit with everybody till this day. I don't even know how long these feelings will last, but I guess it is what it is, right? Oh, Crystal. <laughs> It's okay. I feel like it'll last a lifetime. You know, it's yeah. it's something that you just don't ever get over. You know, you learn yeah. to deal with it in in the process. And yeah. it's too, it's my daughter um, is going through her own grief, and it's like she's so angry all the time. Yeah. Um, after he passed, it's like she don't. She used to sing. She don't want to sing anymore. She don't want to do this. She's doing really. She was a really good student. Now she's just all over the place. So everybody's. Mm -hmm. Different. different. Dealing with it differently. Right. And yeah. it's hard for me as a parent to cope with my own grief and her grief as well. So that's another part. I, right. I'm working yeah. through that. Definitely. And, it's, and that's the good part that you're working through it. And what I wanted to ask you guys, so this Swiss American psychiatrist, she's the one that created this model, the Ross model, right? So there's the five stages. There's denial. So what I want to ask you guys, like, did you feel that you guys got stuck in any of these places? There's anger where you get angry and you're just upset that this happens. There's bargaining, there's depression, and there's a lot more emotions. But do you feel that you got stuck in any of those places, anger, or, you know, just, and, and, and sometimes, you know, sometimes you skip them. Yeah. Sometimes you don't even go to this one, or you might not spend five days on this one. You may spend, you know, a certain amount, and then sometimes you go back. So there's no, because I always hear people say, well, well, I heard somebody say, well, her husband died 20 years ago. She should be over that by now. There is no time yeah. there. And nobody should feel guilty. You drive in one day and a song comes on. There's some songs uh, when Kaylee's mother died, there was a song, I, it's, God forgive me, it's a white lady. I think it's called In the Eyes of an Angel or something. It's an old song. I could never <laughs> listen to it because it made me think of her because, you know, her mom was like the sweetest lady in our family. And it was like, Really, God? She's this lady praying all the time, praying for people. Right. What, what, what you doing? I don't understand, you know? Mm -hmm. And as you grow in your spirituality and you learn things, and you learn there's some things you'll never have an answer to, you That's know? That's very true. And I don't, you know, and I think having a relationship with God, it doesn't That's make you perfect, perfect, but it makes you able to have these kind of conversations with him. Mm -hmm. Like, God, I could have used my grandma for five more years. Really? Would you? You know, yeah. so... I would, I would love to, to hear that answer from the children. Yeah. 
How did, who how lost, did you feel? You guys you that get? lost it as children, you know. That, um, I didn't go. It wasn't. It wasn't for me. It wasn't a denial. It, it was a. I believed it. As soon as soon as it came out, as soon as the news broke. Yeah. I believed it right away. I overheard it by walking into the house and my grandmother and some other family members were talking about it. So when I walked in, I heard I heard them speaking and I stopped and I was eavesdropping. And it I got the whole news without the me and I went back out. They didn't even know that I heard and was already fully aware of what happened. I come home later on that evening, walked in, my grandmother go to, you know, to the whole story of prepping me for it. And I was no, I was so nonchalant. I was, I was big boy because I was my grandmother's big guy. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, I was young. Mm-hmm. I was her yeah. man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. I was. It's like I took it well, according to her. You know, because mm-hmm. she didn't know that you already she knew. Didn't know that I already knew. Wow. Did you go through grieving when you initially found out? Like, what was that? I, I, as I tell you, I still, I don't believe I even grieve yet to this day. Wow. Wow. I'm still in. Denial. Not denial. I'm mm-hmm. still in the man of the house stage. Mm-hmm. I got to be strong for everybody else. Right. That's, right. That's how I felt. I felt even yeah. to this day, like I had to take on, like I had to, I can't be the one crying. I can't be mm-hmm. the one this. And that sticks and me to this very Day. That that's definitely that hits home because I ended up becoming the man of the house or the wow. man of the family, um, and although I had older, you know, men in my family, it was you're the only man right now that's going to college. You're the only man right now that's you know not having a child out of wedlock. You're the only man like it. Just these standards just became they fell on me. Fell on me. The, the those responsibilities, responsibilities absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I think for the longest I was in denial until I was eighteen. I never forget um, August twelfth. 2007, I went into college, um, and one, it was a, a funny day because my aunts thought they would have the sex talk with me, uh, which was interesting. <laughs> I'm like um, 18, <laughs> but uh, you know they did they did the best they could, you know, and I don't I don't blame them at all. But um, I was putting pictures on my wall in my dorm room, and I was sitting at my desk, and I had all these amazing <laughs> pictures up of my family, friends from the last, you know, 10, 15 years or what have you. Mm-hmm. And in this little, like, it was like this perfect, it was an eight by 10 or eight by 11. It was perfect. It was like a perfect shape. Right. That the one last picture I had was a picture of me and my mother. Mm. And it fit perfectly right there. And I think that's when I accepted the fact that my mother was gone. Well, wow. wow. And I was just like, oh, this is real. Mm. Like, she's not walking. I thought she would come through church. It would, yes. You know, I just, I thought she was going to show up. At some point. And at some point. And then I started having dreams. Mm. Um, and Eight years later. Yeah. Wow. And even to this day, like, I remember uh, something was going on earlier this year, uh, earlier 23, excuse me. And um, I was so stressed out about it. And she came to me in a dream and she said, hey. I said, hey, where you been? And she's like, you know, I've been around. I'm like, cool. <laughs> and she and she literally says to me, Travis, everything is going to be all right. Nice. And from that moment, I've just been living and coasting on this happiness that everything is going to be all right. You just don't need to stress about all this other stuff that makes mm-hmm. no sense. Life is too short. Yeah. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah. So denial definitely was a, a big what one for me. I thank mm-hmm. you so much for that, Dr. Boyd. Um, I want you guys to start thinking about some words that you would leave with somebody that's going through um, struggle right now. But I wanted to just say this before we get off. Um, I need you guys to think about how many times you have said that you need to pray for
what is it that they need? Because or yeah, ask. They're, yeah, ask. Or and, ask is right. They may not know at the time because they don't know what's going on themselves. Mm-hmm. They're trying to grasp. So a good thing to do is just be available. Because like Keely said, sometimes people leave. And you mean, well, as Barry said, you're like, let me know what you need. I'm going to do this. And you're waiting for people to reach out. They're not, not going to reach, they're not gonna reach out. Yeah. And express your feelings. Don't keep it bottled up. I'm not a therapist. I got a few more credits to me, but... I'm not a therapist. Get it out because trust me, it's going to leak on other people if you don't get it out. Yeah. Somehow or another, you have to express your feelings or it's going to be like an elephant sitting on your chest That's correct. and you never get it out. <coughs> so, um, before we get out of here, I would just like you guys to um, share some words of encouragement to somebody out there that may be watching this, that may be grieving. Um, also, you know, some people can't deal with death and they've taken their lives because they're like, my loved one is not here and I don't want to be here. And the pain is heavy. The pain is heavy mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. It takes a strong spiritual sense. It takes a strong determined mind to say, nah, I'm not leaving here. I got some other things that I need to do. But, you know, that grief is so painful. It's just like, mm-hmm. it's one of those things you can't do anything about. You just have to go through the process. So Carlton, starting with you. Let us hear something that you would say to someone as they go, something that helped you and something that you think could help others, please. I think definitely for me through my process was, as I know for, for black men especially, we don't like to cry. We like to say we, we the man in the house, so we like to do this, but it's okay to cry. Mm-hmm. And you can just take your time by yourself. What I like to do is kind of just walk around and feel like I'm talking to that person. Just say things out. They don't got, I don't have to have an answer back, but sometimes other things come back to me. Or just memories come back where it answers my question where I just feel like I'm talking to that person. Mm-hmm. I do that with my brother a lot because um, one thing we did talk about before was I still felt angry to even some to this day because I didn't really get to say goodbye to my brother. Mm-hmm. My phone was off when my uncle had to come to my house and bang on my window to let me notify me in the middle of, in the middle of the morning yes. that my brother had passed. So I never really got to see the body as it went and not till the funeral day. Mm-hmm. So that's something I was always angry about. I never really got to say goodbye to my brother. But just me talking later on, just feel like I'm talking to him. Seems just some of the memories of my, of my and my son and him just kind of talking it out kind of gave me a little ease with my grief with him. So definitely, if you have that, just take some time by yourself and try to act like you're talking to the person. Just tell them what, what's on your heart. I think that's a, that's a big thing that helped me. I love it. And uh, Dr. Boyd? Um, what I've learned, there's a scripture, uh, Acts 26 or 27, that talks about how Paul went through the shipwreck um, and Paul being a prisoner in this ship, in, in this ship uh, and uh, when the ship went through its wreck, the same people that came to uh, take Paul uh, to prison was the same people Paul helped to free out of the shipwreck. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just reminds me of this a sermon I used to preach. It's, it's called, I Made It on Broken Pieces. Mm-hmm. And the Bible says that some made it on boards of the ship, some made, made it on pieces of the ship, but they all made it. And I think about my life and just encouraging others, like understand that, Life is going to hand you a whole bunch of broken pieces. Come on. Um, but it's what you make out of those broken pieces that really sustains you. Yes. Um, and so, you know, it's easy to say never give up. You know, it's easy to say, you know, don't throw in a towel. Yes. Um, but I can just, just say, just keep the faith and have faith in yourself. Yeah. If anything else, have faith in yourself that you know you will make it. So. Yes, that um, I think uh, having a conversation with God after losing my brother... He gave me an analogy, and he was just like, um, I was just like, well, God, why? You know, I was just asking certain questions. Conversation with him after losing my mother was I was angry, and I went off. Mm -hmm. Conversation after losing mother, father, and then brother, it was like, well, help me have peace that passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. Let me have that, Lord, but now I need understanding right now, though, also. And then he was just like, you know how you send— your kids to school, Kaylee. And I was like, yeah. He was like, and when you go to that bus stop or you go and wait outside the school, you're waiting for Jer- Jeremiah at the time. We call him Moochie to come out. And I'm like, yeah. He was like, I was like, yeah. I love-. He said, you know that feeling? I said, yeah. He goes, imagine if they never come home. And imagine if they never come out. And I was like, okay. So why you take my mother, father, and brother? He said, because they're mine. Mm-hmm. And I need my children to come home. So what I need from you right now, first of all, I'm going to give you your peace that passes all understanding. (laughs) But what I need from you right now is to trust me 
And also understand that it's not about you. Mm. And I was like, well, okay, fine. <laughs> like, he was like, and then in this life, you're here. He gave me my purpose and was like, your purpose is to serve me. Your purpose is to bring others close to me. I've given you all of this. Now I need you to do something with it for others and tell them who I am and why I sent you and why I need you to come home. And that home that you're at is not your end all be all. These are my children. That was just your vessel. I am your mm. parent. And I was like, all right, so what happens next? And he said, I fill the voids. And I was like, ain't, ain't no void feeling my mom, my dad, or my brother. I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> God, but let's talk about that. And he was like, yeah, well, the void is the peace. Mm. Don't look for it in the people. I'm going to give you that peace that you keep praying for that pastors mm. all understand it. That's good. And I was like, all right. So now when people pass, I'm like, I don't grieve people any longer. Same. I'm not, I wasn't, I'm not sad that my grandmother died. I'm not sad that anyone else died. I'm more sad to watch the people grieve. And I I mourn the feeling for them. I'm like, mm -hmm. gosh, I pray that they have that peace that I had. Like when my parents died, I prayed for peace and didn't want people to touch me. But I'll be like, God, can you hold me in a way that no human can? Mm -hmm. And he would, I would just feel this sudden peace. And then my tears would just go away and I'm over here making food or playing. And I'm like, wait, a minute yeah. ago, I was... Mm. And then I was like, God, I need you to hold me real quick, please. I need you to hold me. And then I'll just feel this. It would just be a peace. feeling. So it's, I would say pray for peace that passes all understanding and then understand your purpose here on earth. You just wrote my next sermon. Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say take it day by day. Yes. Um, especially if it's kind of recent. Uh, Every day, you just have to kind of fill in. And if you can, talk to somebody. Talk to a therapist. I mean, I don't, but I, maybe I should. <laughs> um, Same. But uh, it's a day-by-day -day thing for me. Um, that's all I could say. Take it day-by-day. Day. Yeah. Mr. Barry, uh, For me, um, it's being understanding to anybody's plight. I'm one of the persons that I could put my feet in everybody's shoes and kind of get an understanding of what you may be going through. Empathy. So me being able to do that, it helps me to adjust to how they're doing. And this is why I'm like among people's favorite guy in their circle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I become that, that go-to guy for a lot of people in my life. And just by me seeing and sending a text to people, I'm here. You know how to reach mm -hmm. me. They don't just take it as just a fly by night text because mm -hmm. I live what I do all kinds of lines. So they already know I'm dependable. So I said, like, sometimes we, we, didn't, we didn't accept people of, uh, of help in some way right. because we're already seeing how they live. So they already proved sometimes in some way of how they was already moving that they're not mm -hmm. going to be realistic in they're going to be there. Hey, I'm here. Or, you know, because we didn't right. see you mm -hmm. in every day of my life. I see how you act. So why at this grieving time that I'm going to believe that even you... more? But nevertheless, thank you for what you said. You know, yeah. you move on. Your words. <laughs> your, yeah, your, your work. Yeah. So for me, I, like, I love the person who I became due to all the tragedies of life. That part. Yeah. 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 My first death that I really witnessed and didn't even know it until my 30s was I was a twin. My twin died seven minutes of life wow. after being born. Mm. Didn't even know of the story, but throughout my whole life, I could constantly tell you, I felt a void. Mm. Even when my mom died, I didn't, I felt, I, I remember clicking like, she dead. But this is not the person I'm grieving. There's something else going on. Mm. Oh, it felt like there was something like, even with my mom, you know, mm -hmm. like I didn't feel like that was the death I was supposed Wanted, to hear about. Yeah. It went into my 30s when I went to look for my mom's in some fashion or where she's buried at, that I kind of find out from, um, they, um, what's, where we get your birth certificate and all that from? Yeah, downtown. Downtown. Mm -hmm. That they told me, hey, we can't find your mama, but did you know you had a twin that died seven minutes of life? That was that's blind blind. yo. That was the open of all openers. Yeah. I didn't agree about nothing until I mean, y'all. When I, <laughs> I was, I would, you know, I was mentally stuck. I was in front of stuck, and nobody told you. When you, when you, when you, 
as you you walk this life where you're raised on one side of the family, other side of the family, more, more side, more so than this side that you currently on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So a lot of people don't get to pass the story on because they didn't know it was detrimental for them to remember to pass it on to. Then something, something they think that you already know. Right. And then those people who do know come about passing off and dying, and then you could have got the real story, but they no longer here. So now you mm. walk, you like, and then you you're walking around family members. Yeah, I think I heard something like that. And, wow. You know, so it was one of those things that people knew of the story, but thought you knew, so mm-hmm. they forgot how the real story went. So it's kind of went blatant. Yeah. Forgotten in some sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, I get it. But it couldn't yeah. really connect you to the real story. But back in the days, also, yeah, people kept everything a right. secret. Right. Like so, when those mm-hmm. high ox in our family die off at the grandmothers, the yeah, mom, you know, and the and secret the, and, and it don't right. get passed on to like mm-hmm. right now. I have a cousin named TJ. My cousin TJ, she's like the archive of, of all things now. Mm-hmm. She's one of the two who decided to take the torch and run with the torch to be that background of everything. And, and other family members like my cousin Black, and you know, they all decided somebody. They're the uh, that hierarchies now that we mm-hmm. kind of get information from. You right, know? gotcha. But again, it's being who we are, and and people remember who you are, so they know that you're valid, and and I can call because I know you are valid. Mm-hmm. You know, I will answer. No, well, you know. Accepting people for what they say and, and really embracing it. Don't Absolutely. Don't put no judgment by it. Don't wait for them to walk when you got some hidden heart that she ain't going to do nothing. No, you, you, cause now you're putting another evil spirit into the air. Right. A, yeah. A stink, accept it for what it is that you mm-hmm. hope they mean as well as they mean. Yeah. You still go to your go-tos. Yeah, yeah, that part. That part. That's true. You know, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Guys, this has been an awesome show. I want to remind you if you're grieving out there, I want to remind you to do something that would honor your loved one. When my grandmother passed, I decided to do the things that would remind me of her, whatever it is. Find that thing, that special thing. Sometimes I don't feel like dancing if I'm at a party and I say to myself, hey, my aunt can't dance. My grandmother can't dance. I'm going to dance for them, even if I'm tired. So whatever it is that you do, whether it's baking bread, going shopping, do something to honor that person. If it's throwing up the balloons, something that makes your heart happy. And it's okay to mourn. Grief is the price that we pay for love. I thank you so much for joining us today here at the Leslie T. Marshall Experience. I want to thank all my wonderful guests for sharing and going deep. I know grief is not an easy subject, but thank you so much for joining us here today. And again, we will be back. Have a fantastic day. Thank you. Bye.